So good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Welcome to our fourth annual CEO roundtable, which we have recast this year as a CEO briefing. So you may ask why the change? Well, we thought that there was just one question on people's minds, and that was the impact of the pandemic on our business organizations and on our economy and what the implications might be immediately, of course, and then going into the future. So uh, we have with us uh, here this morning, uh, Margaret Reed, who I will introduce in a minute, who is uh, a vice president and analyst for uh, the Union Bank, their private bank um, uh, division. And then we also have a panel of uh, business leaders. We do have a, a change there. I wanna mention we have with us uh, Carissa Cruz, who's the president of Sonoma County Wine Growers, Xavier Onkovic, who's the CEO of Amy's Kitchen, and then finally, uh, Ron Mircessian, the CEO of uh, Keysight Technologies, had a family emergency. We wish him the best. Uh, and in his place here, Keysight has a deep well of talent. We, we are lucky to have Ingrid Estrada, who is the Chief Administrative uh, Officer at Keysight. So we started this uh, event uh, four years ago, five years ago, uh, with the idea that there uh, was no place for our communities to hear directly from our, our chief executive officers that they could talk about the, the things that they see. And boy, what having had a, a, a chance to chat with all of these people here this morning, we're going to have some great insights on the, the current situation and then also where we uh, may be going. So I want to thank the organization that stepped up to become our founding underwriter, and that is the Union Bank, and that is the Union Bank. And thank you very much uh, to Union Bank for coming back again this year and uh, agreeing with us really that we should have someone like Margaret here with us. So I'm gonna to introduce to you uh, Margaret Reed, who's the Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager, uh, Investment Manager and Trust for Union Bank, the private bank. She's coming to us, I think from San Francisco this morning. Uh, Margaret, um, has a Bachelor of Arts from uh, California State University, Sacramento, and is a CFA uh, charter um, holder since 2012. She speaks frequently in the financial media, such as CNBC. And you can also see her contributions in, in financial uh, publications, such as Barron. So please welcome Margaret Reed. Thank you, Margaret, for being with us. Thank you, Brad, and thank you to everyone joining us today. On behalf of Union Bank, certainly a pleasure to include us in your annual CEO briefing for the North Bay Business Region. Uh, indeed, I am native here, San Francisco Bay Area, a resident in the East Bay, and certainly uh, have clients all around the region. Uh, so again, thank you. In today's opening segment, my goal here is to give everyone on the line here today a brief update on the economy, the markets, and also provide some insights as it relates to the, the, a lot of our end markets here, the consumer, uh, which is a big part and an important factor in our recovery and our economy. So with that, I'm going to share my screen now with some presentation slides uh, to show you a bit of what you know, we're talking about from our investment team standpoint and uh, some insights as it relates to the consumer and just provide you some visuals along the way here. So one moment, please. Let's get this. There we go. So clearly this year has been one of epic challenges. The COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the ongoing economic crisis, uh, the raging fires that have obviously impacted much of the Western region and most particularly in the North Bay area where many of you sit today, uh, and the uncertainty of U.S. elections and where is our economy going from a policy standpoint. Uh, so this has certainly been a year of loss and one of uh, real kind of increased anxiety out there in the marketplace. Uh, but I'd also want to bring forth to the notion of some silver linings that you know, this is an economy that is shifting, that is evolving and healing in many ways. Uh, but obviously, uh, a big key part of the reason behind that is a lot of these consumer behavior changes that we're seeing on from an economic standpoint. And I'm sure many of us on the line here today are realizing that and seeing that in our own day to day. 
so as it relates to the economic recovery, you know, in the investment team world, we tend to uh, depict them in uh, letter shapes. <laughs> so here on this first slide is around the economic recovery and not necessarily the V-shape that we like to see. It's been more of a K-shaped recovery. Uh, since the crisis in March has developed, uh, you know, for those that are the consumer that's in the upper end of the K here, that's been gainfully employed, that's seen their investment portfolios go back to pre-crisis highs, that see their home values increase, you know, that part of the economy has been stable and a big driver in the recovery thus far. On the lower end of the K is the lower end consumer, which obviously, you know, has been impacted more so by the service economy recession that has really been the focus point and the most impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. So here, a big reason why we've seen this recovery uh, been be so swift, uh, at least in the early days here and early months, is really the stimulus. So we had our Federal Reserve come out very swiftly and with very largest uh, putting funds, buying, cap, buying corporate bonds for the first time in, in their history, uh, supporting the, cre the credit markets, taking zero, you know interest rates to zero. We had the U.S. Treasury uh, really fueling uh, the stimulus out to consumer wallets with the raised unemployment checks going out. The PPP program, which helped create that bridge for small business owners. Hopefully, many of you on the line were able to benefit from that to help bridge, you know, what was a very abrupt crisis for our economy. Uh, so the big question from here is when is the next stimulus round coming? And I think once we get through the election and we get our Congress back in operating order, uh, I think that will be the first thing up in front and center that needs to happen uh, to continue the economic recovery from where we stand today. And the main reason why we need that stimulus is because we are still in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's no secret that case rates across the United States are rising once again. We're entering the winter months and really difficult to see how we can bend the curve in terms of infection rates in this country. And it's even, you know, obviously a worse uh, situation in Europe uh, with they have many less levers than we do in the United States to help combat this, uh, this pandemic. And so you can see these case rates here on a global basis uh, that this is kind of the growing risk and growing concern, both from an economic standpoint, but also from that standpoint of the needed stimulus to get us through uh, what is likely to be some choppy months ahead. But pulling this all together in what here is, you know, on display, th these are numbers through the end of September, just really showing that bifurcation that's not only happened in the economy, but also in the equity markets and some of the other capital markets here. So we've had the technology sector has been the best performing sector on a year to date basis, uh, which really demonstrates and sh is shows here on display how our economy and our consumer has increased because of the crisis, their need for technology and for connectivity. Uh, so that's definitely been, uh, you know, displaced here on, on the technology NASDAQ uh, performance side. On the flip side, you've seen the more economically sensitive areas like oil prices down 60% year to date. And, you know, fast forward to today where we've had, you know, some good additional equity returns in the market because a little bit less uncertainty as it relates to the U.S. election. Uh, having a divided government, I think that is absolutely one of uh, the most positive things coming out of the election. That's good for the capital markets in general. And then obviously we had that uh, great Pfizer news on their vaccine on Monday that really drove some additional returns in the equity markets, uh, which certainly is welcome. Um, any vaccine no news for the markets is a positive because that gives the market some insight to when we might return to some normalcy in our economy and get through this pandemic. But let's shift gears and talk a bit about the consumer. Uh, so I made mention earlier about this service economy uh, really at the heart of this recession. And you can see that on display here showing kind of where our services spending has uh, gone to, where it's recovered to. And you can see that the spending on services like your travel, leisure, restaurants, et cetera, has lagged this recovery and has not returned to pre-crisis levels. On the flip side, you can see how the spending on goods has 
uh, return to pre-crisis levels. And that actually speaks to a lot of these underlying consumer shifts and trends that uh, have really you know, been a function of this pandemic, which I'll get to a little bit more in detail in a moment here, but just to give a few other data points on the, where the consumer stands. So this is through the end of September showing unemployment, which obviously, here at, at a peak at close to 15% in April has recovered uh, down to 7.9 in September and that trickled down to 6.9 in October. And then on the other side of the picture is consumer confidence, which has also been lagging. And I think that's pretty much to be expected because of the amount of anxiety out there, whether it's COVID-19, uh, case rates increasing, the US elections. Uh, so there's a little bit of that hesit hesitancy there in terms of consumer confidence, but I think actually it's it's something that we should be expecting to continue, uh, particularly as we're going into next year. But the one silver lining though here, um, and why in my mind there can be some cautious optimism as it relates to consumer spending, uh, particularly going into the critical period of, of the holiday season, is the state of consumer balance sheets. So we have here the savings rate in the United States. Uh, this is through the end of August at 14.1%. Uh, and this is you know, a function of consumers that were locked in their homes for however many months, depending where you sit across the country. And then uh, the inability to actually spend on certain categories. So typically the summer months are a high spend in terms of travel or global travel. Clearly, there's a hesitancy for travel, particularly on a, on a global basis for consumers. So that shift of travel of experiences that, you know, that's, those are very big ticket items that essentially the consumer shifted and now spending more on the home, spending on connectivity. So now we're trying to work from home, school from home, play from home. Um, all those things require more technology and more spending on the home. And that's essentially the shift that's been happening from a category perspective and why there might be some spent, some built up savings uh, happening there in addition to all the stimulus that went into consumer wallets earlier in the summer. And then on the right hand side here shows consumer spending by income cohort. And again, just on display how the recovery for the low income consumer has been lagging this recovery versus the high-end consumer, which is you know, essentially not seen a blip on the screen because they've remained employed. They've seen their asset values and their balance sheets increase. So I, my, one main question that I get uh, quite often actually from my client base is, you know, why isn't this like a global financial crisis? And this, this slide here shows exactly why. It is, has not been like the global financial crisis uh, and again, a big reason has been stimulus. A big reason has been where the consumer was from a place of strength going into the crisis. Um, so on display here is the US retail sales data that shows what took 33 months in the global financial crisis to get back to where we were from a US retail sales level. We've achieved that as an from an economic standpoint in a matter of eight months. So. Um, very, very, I think, important data point just to demonstrate the level of resiliency of our U.S. consumer end market, uh, but also, too, that, you know, this crisis has been different, and it's really, again, been a function of the stimulus, the level, and the swiftness getting into our economy, and how important it's been to the economic recovery. So this slide here um, has, again, on the points of silver linings, and also speaks to a lot of the underlying consumer trends. Uh, so in many ways, it's important to focus on kind of what are the long lasting behavioral shifts uh, for consumers, because that can really drive direction for our economy, direction for certain sub industries. And so if you think about, you know, that consumer that is looking for a bigger space to either work from home, school from home, play from home again, either within their home or outside of their home. And the amount of migration that's gone to urban centers over the past five to seven years, well, that is unraveling with the pandemic. And it's causing consumers, uh, particularly the millennium consumer, consumer, excuse me, consumer who, you know, has really delayed the onset of starting their families, purchasing that first home, uh, which in my mind, I think this pandemic has been a trigger for that millennial demographic to realize that they need to start, st start those first homes, start those purchase of those new homes. And that's what you see on display here on the right-hand side, uh, new home sales, existing home sales, 
again, this crisis has been a blip on the screen because of one, the state of health from that consumer balance sheet standpoint, low interest rates going to zero, that's certainly improved affordability for that end consumer to purchase that new home. And then again, this migration uh, that's happening really across the country. In fact, one data point that I had yesterday speaking to a real estate analyst, 90% of the apartments in New York City have two bedrooms or less. So we're not only seeing this in the North Bay or in the East Bay or greater Northern California, we're seeing this across, across the country. And it's really you know, driving some in, improvement in a lot of these sub-industries that are actually very important to the economic recovery. If you think about construction, home construction, et cetera, again, it's an important part of, of this economic recovery. And on the automotive side, you know, clearly, I think the structural shift of consumers not taking mass transit to work, not having to go to work <laughs> for at least the medium term future, uh, and also moving out of those urban centers, requiring another vehicle uh, between, you know, between the households uh, has also, I think, been a critical reason for the automotive sector um, getting back to essentially pre-crisis levels in pretty short order. So, so in my mind, when I'm talking about consumer trends and what does this all mean, right? Especially, especially as we go into the holiday season, I think first, first of all, consumers and the adoption rate of e-commerce has absolutely been something already that was structurally happening before the crisis and post-pandemic. Now we have an end consumer that understands the value, the convenience of of using you know, the digital e-commerce pickup in store, curbside pickup. Uh, so I think that is something that is absolutely going to be ingrained in the consumer psyche and consumer behavior. So for any businesses, um, business owners on the line who has an, you know, a consumer end market, ensuring that you're staying connected to that consumer, ensuring that you're providing those digital ways for them to get your service, get your products uh, delivered to the home or picked up from your, from your um you know, your retail space, I think that will just be ever critical to every business owner uh, really across the United States. And then focusing on the home. So, you know, consumers clearly have already spent a lot of dollars as relates to home, you know, home decor, home improvement. Uh, but let's think about how, how can we spend time with our families, which is so much needed in this very isolating time. So in my mind, I think another key category will be home occasions, uh, which I know can be very important for the wine industry. Hopefully we have those on the line as well. Uh, so focusing in on kind of personal well-being, that is also another key trend that's been on display uh, and certainly a topic that I speak a lot with my clients is the importance, growing importance and recognition of personal well-being. And then that, again, is kind of driving this renewed spending across some of these personal wellness categories. Um, the home decor categories, um, also connectivity, you know, with technology, uh, ever more important, I, particularly in my household with two young daughters and two working uh, parents, it's, that's going to also be a key category in my mind going into the holiday season. And I, one other thing to note, too, is just around where could there be potential pent-up demand. So I think another, you know, Another experience of the consumer of travel, right, has been so critical to how consumers have spent their time and their leisure. And that, you know, again, was flipped on, you know, flipped on its back with the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, I think in my mind, this means that travel will happen, but it's going to be travel by, by vehicle. It's going to be localized travel. I think the, the heyday of traveling globally uh, is going to be from vacation, et cetera. That's going to be very much more disparate. And again, you know, when we talk to clients about how to, you know, adjust portfolios and what, what are the certain areas to avoid, it's really around where can things or industry structurally change. And you could, in some ways, see how global travel could change, how mall retail can change structurally, office you know, office buildings, how much are those going to be needed for the foreseeable future if, let's say, a third of the workforce across the United States doesn't have to go into the office ever again because of this new new reality and new efficiency that's happening uh, really across the corporate landscape. So I'm going to uh, close my segment here with 
you know, speaking around what are we looking, what are we looking at going into next year and what in our mind is key to the continuation of the economic recovery? And the answer is jobs. Clearly this has been, you know, a, a negative impact of the service economy, like I mentioned. So this chart here shows the lower income consumer employment rate. And again, how that's lagged the recovery uh, but, you know, the job recovery is, I think, in, in many ways, very critical to the continued healing of our economy, to the continued recovery in the economy, because the big question is how, how much, again, if we have, you know, the upper case part of our economy doing quite well and continuing to recover, while the lower end of that K, K economic recovery continues to lag. Um, but again, I think if we have continued stimulus going into the economy to bridge the gap until we have a vaccine that is actually fully distributed to our population, uh, maybe that's spring or summer next year, if we have you know, this continued resiliency of the U.S. consumer, uh, either, either from their um, balance sheet standpoint or their income standpoint, that you know, there's clearly more work to be done for sure for this recovery, but I think too, there's reasons to have cautious optimism going into next year. So with that, Brad, I'll hand the mic back to you. Thank you, thank you, Margaret. Uh, she's going to, after our panel, come back and be there for questions, but I, if I could ask you just briefly here, on the next, uh, the PPP program, the Payroll Protection Program uh, was supposed to be for to cover two months of payroll, right? So we're in right. month nine. So how likely do you think a similar program uh, is in the, and in, in when uh, next year? That's a great question, Brad. I, I think the answer will be, there should be and could be another PPP program, but I think all the, communication coming from Washington is that that program needs to be more targeted. Clearly, there was a lot in the media during the, those yeah. early months of those funds going to businesses that didn't necessarily need it, which mm -hmm. left out a lot of businesses that did need it. So I think that should be the next chapter of this program. Uh, again, very much needed to bridge, you know, bridge the gap for these small businesses that are still under pressure. Yes, yes. Well, once again, thank you uh, for being with us this morning. Hopefully you'll return uh, after the panel uh, to, to answer any questions. Okay. There, actually, there was one that I might as well ask now. What, with all this cash going into the economy, what's the threat of inflation? Another great question, Brad. So actually we had some inflation data come out today that came in below expectations. And so, yes, while having so much of these of this cash and purchasing by the Fed uh, certainly is inflationary, but when you have the amount of economic output gap that's happening in the economy still, the, that level of stimulus uh, cannot more than offset what's happening from that economic output standpoint. So I think because we still have, call it 7% unemployment out there, we still have businesses that are in structural need uh, until we actually get more of a, we'll say, a closing of that gap, that you know, that's when really inflation will rear its head. But for now, I'd say it's, it's if we do have any inflation, it's going to be more of a back half 2021 topic of conversation, at least from that investor standpoint. Okay, and if if I may, one more question. This is a good one too. So, your your data is fantastic. That that one on retail sales is really really telling. So. Uh, and this question from our audience, um, do the unemployment numbers reflect, I mean, usually unemployment is people who are looking for work, right? That's how it's measured typically. Uh, is there a larger number that just sim simply stop looking or is that really reflective? Or are we seeing what's real in the, uh, in the employment markets? I think that's another great question because uh, certainly there's been plenty of studies as of late showing the amount of workers that have just left the job market, mm -hmm. right? If you think of, and particularly women as a demographic have been more impacted on a relative basis mm -hmm. um, because of the nature of the pandemic, because of the nature of essentially, I have two daughters that are 10 and 11 years old. I have to you know, essentially be a student assistant teacher at some at yeah. some points during my day and how many women are not able to do that. 
You know, it's a real structural issue, our, our education system. So but back to the question around um, how many workers have actually left the workforce and is, is this unemployment picture really accurate? I'd say probably, I, this picture is probably not as accurate as it should be, but there have been a lot of workers that have, have either retired or taken that you know, early retirement package because they can, and they see no reason to continue to work if they need to help support their family. So that's, that's a great question and one obviously that needs to continue to be monitored because mm -hmm. again, we need job growth, we need income growth uh, to continue to support the spending growth of the economy. Great. Well, Margaret, once again, thank you so much for being with us. Great presentation and we'll see you back when we We'll get to the panel questions. Thanks, thanks again so much. Thank you, Rad. Thank you. So next, uh, we have a, a panel of business leaders, um, starting with Ingrid Estrada, who was the Chief Administrative Officer and Chief of Staff for Keysight Technologies. Uh, Carissa Cruz, who's the President of Sonoma County Wine Growers. And Xavier Unkovic, who is the CEO of Amy's Kitchen. And I've had the pleasure of spending a little time talking with all of them. And I think you're in for a real, real treat uh, in our discussion here. So I'm going to start uh, by just having each of them tell us a little bit about uh, themselves and their organization. So uh, Ingrid, if I could, can I start with you? Sure, that's fine. Thank you. And um, I have a slide that also has a few stats about Keysight on it. So maybe I'll just get started with myself first and then we'll get that slide going. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for um, inviting me to speak today. Um, sorry about uh, Ron's inability to make this meeting. Um, he has a family issue that he's working through this morning. Um, but nonetheless, uh, luckily he had some good slides ready to go. <laughs> um, so as uh, Brad said, I'm chief of staff. Um, I also manage our global human resources organization, all of our global real estate footprint, corporate procurement, and um, a host of other corporate services like our corporate social responsibility programs. Um, so if you wanna take a quick look at this slide, here's some stats about Keysight. I think many of you already know, uh, we're headquartered here in Santa Rosa, but we are a very global company, over 32,000 customers around the world. We have um, more than 100 countries that we have uh, uh, either customers or employees in. Um, we have 30 countries where we have sites uh, we have over 3,000 patents and we're about a $20 billion cap. Um, you can see our revenue is almost um, split evenly between, um, or half of it's from commercial communications, otherwise mostly known for 5G, aerospace defense government, and then electronic industries. And our employees are pretty much equally split around the world. Looking forward to the panel today and uh, Back to you, Brad. Once again, Ingrid, thanks for uh, for jumping in and we wish uh, Ron the best. So uh, Carissa, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and the wine growers. Sure, good morning, Brad. Thanks for having me. Thank you to Union Bank for sponsoring this. It's a great opportunity to get together and have a conversation. Um, so I'm Carissa Cruz. I run the Sonoma County Wine Growers. We're essentially a marketing association uh, that supports the 1800 grape growers in both Sonoma and Marin counties. Um, so we do marketing and I, I say we do everything to promote the region as well as um, help our local farmers protect agriculture and to be able to continue doing what they love to do, which is farm. Um, probably uh, one of the things that's become more and more important in the last couple of years is in 2016, we relaunched our Sonoma County Grape Growers Foundation and I run that organization as well. Um, and it supports our local farm workers and their families and was intended to do a lot of things sort of um, around leadership and work, you know, workforce development, but fortunately or unfortunately, we have played a bigger role in supporting our farm worker families mm -hmm. through wildfire and uh, COVID crisis in the past couple of years. So I'll talk more about that as we look ahead to the business. So looking forward to the panel today. Well, thank you, Carissa, and you're to be commended for all that you've done for the, the farm working community. You've been right there, right through fires and through this pandemic and what have you. Thank you. So uh, Xavier Ankovic, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and Amy's Kitchen. 
Good morning, good afternoon, Brad. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, yeah, de definitely delighted to be with you all today. Uh, I've been at Amy's for a little bit more than three years now. Um, as I keep saying with my team, we're here to keep uh, the dream of our founders alive. Uh, Andy and Rachel Berliner that created Amy's Kitchen 30 years ago. And at Amy's, we love to cook for you. This is what we do, we cook and we're proudly independent family owned, as you can uh, imagine, organic food company. Uh, but we're more than this. We are we on, a, on a company journey, a company journey to take care of our consumers by cooking great tasting food with high quality organic ingredients uh, in our kitchens, not our factory, in our kitchens. Uh, a journey to take care uh, of uh, our planet as well, uh, with ultimately a goal of healing uh, uh, the planet and a journey to take care of our people where we believe each person at Amy's play a critical role and can make a difference for consumers, our planet, and for each other. So we're delighted to be here today and, um, and I'm delighted to be with you all. Well, Xavier, thanks again for being with us. For those of you who don't know, Amy's Kitchen actually started in Rachel and Andy's kitchen and they wanted a, some healthy uh, you know, pre-made dinners and they went to the store and couldn't find any. So they created their own. That's our story, 30 and years that's, ago. That's, that's the beginning. So um, we're, we've got some questions here that I'm going to pose to, to all three of the panelists and then we'll get to some a little bit uh, later here uh, that are kind of specific to their organization. But let's start uh, with this one. How has the pandemic changed your organization? And I'm going to start with uh, Xavier. Huh, that's, that's a great question, Brad. <laughs> you know, when I, when I think about this particular crisis, um, it's been quite a, quite a journey for the company and quite a roller coaster, I should say. In the meantime, I have to admit that we, we at Amy's are very um, grateful uh, to operate in a food world uh, and to be considered as a essential business and very thankful to our people and our owners uh, and for the entire company to have mobilized because that, that particular crisis needed the company to mobilize fully. Uh, I'm very thankful to our 2000 manufacturing workers that have come together and that are coming every day, uh, working every day, reinventing their ways of working through social distancing and wearing masks all day long to cook for our consumers and to make food available for our consumers that I need. Uh, thankful for uh, our employees, office employees that are working from home and had to reinvent their ways of working and thankful for our leaders uh, and our manager that have mobilized and, and redefined our company priorities because that particular crisis uh, led us to redefine our company priority massively. Uh, in a very early stage of the crisis, we had to mobilize and define that people and taking care of our people was the number one priority for our company. And quickly reacting to redefining uh, new uh, ways of working and new places to work and, and new safe and healthy and caring and engaging relationships and workplaces. It was our number one objective because we knew that by taking care of our people first, they will take care of the business. And this is exactly what they did. Uh, and, and clearly speaking, our second priority was to service our consumers and customers best. We had to, to reduce tremendously the number of products that we were making available to the marketplace. Why? Because there was a sense of urgency to make more products and, and, and to make more products available to consumers. So we didn't have the luxury anymore to keep producing the 250 products that we were uh, making available in the past, but now we have a limited product offering. But again, this is because we can produce more and make more products available to consumers and customers. And our third priority was, uh, was to keep the business running and to keep business and ensuring business continuity. Uh, so the, the last eight to nine months, uh, Brad, has been very, very challenging. Um, not to mention the fires uh, that have been impact, impacting significantly our personal lives, our life at works, and our life as leaders. As you know, we have manufacturing sites in Oregon 
and California. And this year, uh, there has been fires in Oregon and California, and we had to evacuate our two manufacturing sites. Uh, I personally believe there's going to be a life before uh, and after COVID. And, and that after COVID or that be, be, you know, in COVID is redefining companies' ways of working. Um, in fact, I'm, 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 I'm sad, but I'm quite excited at the same time. And that's very similar with my team. Uh, it's a situation that we can control that we need to do our best with. But uh, let's say that we have to control what we can control. And, and when you are in that mindset, there's a lot of benefits you can extract from this crisis. As I mentioned to you, redefining the priorities according to what they, they needs to really be, but also uh, changing your mindset of being in a winning mindset and in a mindset where you accept the crisis, you, uh, you understand how scary the world is, you cannot uh, not acknowledge it, but you need to embrace it um, and extract the best out of it. And we as leaders, will be judged on what we do and how we do it. Yes. And, um, and that's, that's what the company, that the crisis is redefining for us is this new world where we have to rationalize and accept this new scary world we live in. Mm -hmm. and, and, and from realizing it, defining the right ways of working, the right ways of acting and, and, and trying to be the best at it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that very insightful answer. And I, I Putting people first, I think it, it's very much like what happened after our fires in 2017. Definitely. Companies became the de facto home for a lot of people, and our companies and our communities just just embraced them. Said, "Okay, we're going to keep paying you." There are probably some exceptions out there, but not many that I ever heard of. You know, we'll keep paying you. We'll take care of you. How are you doing? So, so thank you for that. And. Um, you know, I was on a call the other day. I'm not supposed to be the speaker here, but we'll, we'll get to Ingrid here in a second. Is that you know the the the, the initial was close, 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 right? Well, their business leaders said, no, let's open up, open up, open up, new things, and that's that's really the mindset we have to be in. So as tough as it is, so definitely. So thank you, Xavier. Ingrid, uh, to you, how has the pandemic uh, changed Keysight? Yeah. Thank you. So um, I'll uh, just launch into a little bit of uh, context before I highlight some of the topics on the slide. So back uh, in January, actually, we have um, over 1,200 employees in China, including some in Wuhan. Mm -hmm. And so we felt very um, lucky in some ways to have very, very early indications of something going on in China and really tapped into our global footprint there to help us understand how the local teams and governments were reacting. So with that backdrop, we uh, uh, were a little bit ahead of the game back in March where we could already see that um, shutdowns and potential um, exposures were occurring and we wanted to make sure that we kept our employees safe first, that we kept the company strong <clears throat> and then that we would be able to help with the our communities. So with that three priority approach, we uh, started to shut down all of our sites before, uh, a little bit before even the government's mandated that in most countries, including here in Santa Rosa. Hmm. As we did that, we also made sure that we had um, connectivity, IT tools. And again, luckily we have a very global footprint and a lot of our um, uh, employees collaborate using virtual and digital tools already. Um, so we have things like, you know, WebEx, Zoom, Slack, Blue Jeans, um, all sorts of different tools that are used that we could quickly, quickly deploy um, on a much larger scale. Um, we also implemented a, a pretty robust set of safety protocols. Um, we have a global crisis management team that consists of 68 different teams of people um, that look over all 129 sites around the world. And they have a very um, disciplined, robust approach to managing a crisis, whether it be local or global. Um, many, of, uh, many of you have probably heard us speak in the past about the um, responses to the wildfires using that sort of uh, crisis management team approach. So anyway, you can see here are some examples of um, keeping employees healthy and safe. 
we've uh, got everybody working from home now that uh, can work from home. So that's about 10,000 of our employees. The other 4,000 are working at sites because they are primarily in production or R&D positions where they have to uh, access equipment physically. Uh, and so they have a, again, very robust, similar to Xavier, have to wear PPE all day long. Um, and then additionally, we uh, keeping the company strong for our customers and employees is a, another big area of focus for us. So because we're part of the essential uh, work infrastructure, we shut down globally back in March, but by May, uh, June and April, April, May and June, we were already 100% practically back up into production um, around the world at our major production sites. Um, we didn't cut any employees pay, lay anyone off or reduce any hours. We uh, instead uh, were just very, very um, you know, careful on how we spent our expense money. Um, I'm sure as many companies saw it, some expenses went practically to zero, like travel, things that are typically pretty large line items. Um, so that helped quite a bit. And then um, we just did a lot of financial scenario planning to uh, try to be ready for whatever could come next. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. And thank you again for being with us on very short notice uh, sure. this morning. So uh, Carissa, uh, over to you on how has the pandemic uh, changed your organization? Maybe uh, more broadly, agriculture, if you want to uh, sure. answer that. Yeah. yeah, I was actually going to just touch a little bit on kind of the marketplace and then ag and then a, a maybe a few yeah. specific things for our organization. So just in terms of the marketplace, I think Margaret mentioned it, but we certainly have seen some interesting retail spending when it comes to alcohol mm -hmm. and wine. And so um, the latest Nielsen data that I've seen looks at what happened sort of the period of the summer, which is a pretty good comparison as things kind of settled, um, I think, as we got into sort of June, July and August in terms of, you know, trends. And so um, just in terms of that, the biggest winner, um, I would say, in alcohol was actually spirits. So I know a lot of you are probably at home making cocktails and having fun sharing those recipes um, or, or I would say ingredients. Um, so we saw cocktail sort of spirits grow uh, by almost 30% uh, year over year during the summer months. Um, we saw wine go up about 20% and then beer actually lagged and it was about 16% increase but primarily driven by hard, um, hard alcohol, like hard alcohol, hard ciders, um, were the primary in those, in those seltzers, hard seltzers. So those were primarily driving the category. So although that sounds really good for wine, um, 20%, uh, unfortunately what the pandemic did, which we talked about was shutting down restaurants around the country and certainly in our own backyard um, was a dramatic decrease in wine sales. Um, and it, you need, I think the, the number is about 22% increase in sales at retail to offset the losses that were felt the restaurant business. This was particularly felt, I think, by a lot of our wineries locally who really are small, right? So we have about 70% of our wineries produce less than 6,000 cases of wine in Sonoma County. These are micro boutique wineries that really rely on tourism. They rely on direct to consumer um, business on, you know, creating those relationships and also on um, having their wines presented at restaurants where it's more of a bottle personal sell um, to support that. So we kind of saw this co combination of, uh, I hate to say winners and losers, but typically some of our wineries that were better um, suited for sort of delivering sales during the pandemic, more retail wine, some of our larger brands, because um, we found consumers really did uh, want safe exploration uh, during the pandemic. So they're spending very little time in the store. They're minimizing that experience. So they would go in, they would pull a Rodney Strong, a Coppola, a Silver Oak, these bottles, you know, brands that they know very well versus taking sort of a chance or a risk on maybe a brand that they weren't as familiar with. And so um, that has really kind of impacted our wineries overall. Fortunately, we know folks are uh, consuming wine, though, because for a number of reasons, and you probably can check most of them off on your list, too, uh, for relaxation, to providing some sort of, con you know, connectivity with um, friends and family, often on Zoom, a happy hour, a glass of wine with your friends, um, and then some sort of reward um, or treat as we're going through this that wine can provide. And I like to add, for me, it's just sometimes survival of the pandemic uh, brought a lot of wine consumption. So I think some of the folks out there feel that as well. Um, just in terms of agriculture, 
similar to what Xavier sh was sharing, you know, ag has been deemed essential business. Obviously, uh, Mother Nature does not stop for a pandemic. It doesn't know that that's what's going on in the world. So our vines, you know, kept producing grapes, um, you know, and our farmers who are very used to having to respond on an annual basis to what Mother Nature gives them are quite um, adept at sort of quickly um, being flexible and maneuvering. And so we saw them respond quickly to keeping, you know, new protocols to keep their employees safe. Um, we're fortunate if you've spent time out in a vineyard or you can see the vineyards behind me. Um, most of our vine rows are at least spaced six feet apart. So it's kind of the natural um, spacing that is suggested uh, during the pandemic, you know, being outdoors um, also. So we saw our, you know, our, our farmers were putting their, their crews in early pods that they would spend the entire season with, sort of creating sort of small families of workforce um, at, at their own um, vineyard sites. Um, deploying instead of having crews go into one vineyard, maybe if you're a vineyard management company, sending crews around, so smaller groups around to different properties. Um, so you kind of are spreading out the workforce around the county. And then of course, um, our foundation supported our farm workers impacted or their, if they had a spouse impacted by COVID, um, as well as I become an, an expert in all things masks. I had no idea I would know so much about masks and when you use what mask for what. So um, early on in April, our foundation I was able to purchase KN95 masks, and we've given over 10,000 of those away, ensuring that all of our local workforce um, had masks. And then we've also partnered with the Ag Commissioner to get N95 masks, St. Joseph Hospital for fabric masks. So lots of partnerships on masks out there. Um, in addition, one trend that's been occurring over the last couple of years that's actually was fortuitous during the pandemic um, was just a move of our farmers to more full-time employment. So in our farm workers, so kind of moving away from the seasonal workforce, um, the challenge of labor over the years has really um, had our farmers investing in creating jobs year round in order to really um, support having, you know, our farm workers living in Sonoma County and being a part of our community here. So we think that's good. It provides a lot more financial stability um, and a lot more predictability in workforce. So we've seen about a 20% increase in full-time employment since 2017 of our farm workers and about a 50% deduction in our seasonal workforce. So I think providing some comfort that we didn't have a lot of workers, you know, moving in and out and around the state and minimizing that um, certainly is important right. during this pandemic. And then I just think finally for our organization, we're very fortunate that we were able to um, keep our small team employed. Uh, we did pivot to working at home, although I hate the word pivot. So I say swirling and twirling uh, to working at home um, successfully and, uh, you know, been working with our teams to move things, unfortunately, you know, offline to digital where we normally would love to travel or invite people to Sonoma County to experience. Um, we've had to do a lot of that virtually and, and we're meeting people in new places now. So typical, you know, communication would be through what you would think of wine publications. And now we are out there promoting Sonoma County on recipe sites and do-it-yourself sites because we know that that's where sort of folks are going to learn uh, these days and, and so, you know create sort of new experiences. So um, a, a lot of a lot of change, but again, fortunate that we've been able to sort of keep our farming going and uh, and to do a lot of uh, have wine still be a successful part of most people's uh, experience. Well, well, thank you, Carissa. I think there was a a. A, point, uh, a bullet point in Margaret's presentation that I think was very promising for for wine country, and that is that people are probably not going to get on a cruise ship or a you know a European vacation. They're going to drive somewhere, and yes. we are perfectly suited for uh, a, you know a, a forty five minute drive from the Bay Area to uh, whatever the first winery would be here. So, and <laughs> yes, thank you. Yep, we say staycations, daycations, and then vacations. We're ready for everyone, so. Okay, very good, very good. Thank you again. So uh, next question, I'm gonna start with um, Ingrid. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so Ingrid, what are the lessons we should take from these kind of multiple crises as, as business people? We have COVID, we have fires. Uh, the, yeah. what, what kind of lesson should we take from it as business people? Well, uh, as you can see, here's a few bullets on lessons that we've learned uh, as we, you know, has reflected on all of the different challenging situations that have occurred in the last few years around uh, the Sonoma County area. Um, advanced preparation is really a key. We continue to make sure that we have a, a protocol in place and a rigorous uh, leadership cascading team to uh, manage through these challenging uh, and unexpected situations. 
strong leadership really does matter and making sure that we have clear, effective communication to employees has just been a critical success factor for us to make sure that they stay informed, um, engaged, motivated, and connected. Um, especially now in this particular situation, um, it's, it's always like that when it's very challenging and nerve wracking uh, during evacuations, but when the people are now for the long term dispersed, um, it's even more important than ever to have um, methods to keep them connected to each other, to the company, to um, our, our priorities and our strategies. Um, and then, of course, you know, a part of this strong leadership is also the uh, ability to balance short term and long term priorities. I think another key learning is just uh, our, our employees really <clears throat> demonstrated their ability to be very resilient and adaptive. Um, and I think really recognizing that um, and kind of looking for the positives in all of this. There's a lot of um, you know, things that we can't control as Xavier said, but as a, as, a, as a result of all of this, there's actually a lot of positives with not, not traveling as much, people are feeling healthier. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of wellness tools that now people are actually engaging and using. Um, there's a lot of online uh, employee groups where they're sharing best practices on how to work um, more effectively at home. Um, so there are definitely a lot of positives uh, that we'll probably be able to leverage once this is long behind mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you for that, Ingrid. So, you know, uh, this is our, I think our 14th or 15th virtual event that we just decided at the Business Journal uh, last March that we had to continue convening the community and getting information out. And uh, what we've learned from that is that we, you know, we have to over communicate to get the, uh, to, to execute on these things. Uh, there was something I, I wanted to, to mention. Uh, it's, it's a, oh, I know that whoever, whatever company cracks the networking aspect to these virtual meetings, whatever that is, whether it's, I, I, you know, uh, maybe when 5G gets here, we'll be able to do it. But whoever can crack that's going to, um, uh, see, I think, a lot of people uh, running to it. So thank you again, Ingrid. So uh, to you, Carissa, that, that question, um, what key lesson should we, should we take away? Sure. And I mean, I think similar to Ingrid, right? I mean, communication is absolutely key. And I think, um, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, again, we've gotten quite good at sort of going into crisis management mode, especially mm -hmm. around the wildfires and something I would not have said pre-2017, but clearly, um, at least for us in agriculture, you know, that COVID-19 has had a huge impact, but the wildfires actually in the timing of the wildfires this year um, in August uh, created the, an even bigger impact to agriculture. So um, when we just surveyed our local farmers, we were looking at an impact of probably a loss of tonnage, about 50,000 tons that went unpicked or rejected given smoke exposure and issues. And so that's about $150 million loss in crop. And so I think you know, as we think about what, you know, what, how do you sort of move forward through a pandemics and what those lessons are for us, um, one of the important things we learned was just the value of land management and actually the critical role our vineyards can play in slowing and stopping the fires. I know we've said it a number of times, but we continue to see how important agriculture is and sort of our land mm -hmm. management role. And, and um, I think we're gonna see even more of that moving forward. So I think, you know, keeping everyone safe, um, starting with strong communications. We, you know, it, it's now, um, you know, we have all groups of stakeholders that are very easy to sort of put into place where we're communicating across with elected officials, other community leaders um, and our ag community, and then having support in place like we did through the foundation for our farm workers. So, I mean, even through um, to date, we've supported about 1500 farm worker families um, that have been impacted by either the wildfires or, or the, um, COVID-19, so it's about a $1.3 million we've given out just to help sort of bridge um, that immediate need when we have mm -hmm. some sort of disaster or crisis. And Fred, I think you mentioned just the role of our employers locally really stepping up since 2017, probably in ways that we didn't, we weren't pre necessarily prepared to do, but yeah. now know how to do and yeah. have gotten better at. And that, that yeah. tends to be true for agriculture as well as some of our larger, you know, mm -hmm. Xavier and Ingrid representing larger you know, companies, global businesses. Mm -hmm. Well, th thank you for that. I think this land management uh, aspect for the fires has got to play a key factor. Someone I heard uh, last week or so 
but 80% of Napa County is either federal or, or, or state protected land or owned. And so they need to invest in some of this, this land management. Um, and it doesn't have to be ugly. It just means getting rid of the, the saplings and the underbrush so it doesn't get into the canopy and take off. Although I'm not an expert on fires, but that's what I'm told. So, so thank you, Carissa. So to you, Xavier, lessons we can take from these multiple crises? A lot of lessons, Brad, a lot of lessons. You know, I'm gonna build on what Ingrid and Carissa have said, of course, obviously the, the importance of communication to our people, but also our consumer, our customers, but also lessons when it comes to redefining how companies should be thinking how to operate uh, we look at this world now being more volatile, being more uncertain, being more complex, uh, full of ambiguity more than ever. And I don't think this is going to change. The world is not going to become more simple. The world is mm -hmm. not going to become uh, less ambiguous. So we as leaders, as companies, need to learn how to operate within that world, which we call VUCA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and the good news is, as there's way to operate within this, that world, is uh, you fight volatility with vision and values. So how you bring people together, we're mentioning communication, but how your personal company purpose, your company values become more than ever, more important than ever, and how those are guiding you to everything you do and help people to stick around and help people to uh, to stay with you and follow you about where you're going mm -hmm. and helping you as leaders to making the right decisions where we all know that uh, answering crisis, we don't know what decision to take. Yeah, So it's about doing it together, is about mobilizing it together and then finding the answers to the problem together. And mm -hmm. if you don't have a strong vision and values, it's becoming very difficult to do. So uh, then how you you answering uncertainty is is about investing in better understanding. And I was so happy to hear what uh, Margaret's uh, insights today, because that should help us to really think forward about what's coming at us. Investing in more uh, understanding consumer trends, um, buy new buying uh, pattern, uh, where do consumer buy today? We're thinking about e-commerce, you know, where it, it is very important that leaders and business invest into better understanding now more than ever. Uh, um, consumer customer insights are becoming very, very critical about how we should make decisions because uh, we need to be quick, fast, and agile. Uh, do not hesitate for anyone to, to ask for outside help. And this is how we bring clarity and fight the complexity. And finally, for me, it's about uh, answering ambiguity by agility. How do we experiment more, try, test, and learn so uh, we can act with speed because those crises forces us to act with speed and being significantly agile. So for me, it's, it's all about uh, amping up our game, uh, Brad, is uh, uh, when you're slow, you need to be fast. When you're not agile, you need to be agile. Uh, you need to do it together. So in fact, uh, Ingrid was, was mentioning the importance of leadership. Le leadership is not about having all the answers, it's about bringing people together. It's, it's definitely what needs to be happening during that crisis. And I think this is something that uh, should stay after the crisis as well, because what a, what a great world that a world are when people are engaged in your company, yeah. your opinion matters, yeah? yeah. I, I remember us sitting around talking about doing these virtual events back in, in March. And there were so many questions. And the, the thing we came down to is sometimes you just have to go. You just have to do something. So yeah. here, here we are. So Xavier, uh, continuing with you, how, is, how has the pandemic uh, and other challenges uh, changed the future of food or altered the future of food? So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about retail channel that have been impacted or not, because obviously the food service piece, uh, Margaret mentioned it, has been significantly impacted. I'm going to talk more about uh, food and, and the two mega trends that have been um, reinforced that we were seeing happening, but have been accelerating, I should say. It's the first one is about sustainability, and the second one is about health and wellness, or health and well-being, like Margaret was mentioning. Sustainability, I think more so than ever, uh, consumers uh, matter more about sustainability. 
They understand more than ever the impact of climate change. Uh, they, they understand more than ever that the planet is in crisis. Um, um, and consumers realize they can vote with our uh, wallet and they can have a significant impact by buying better uh, for the planet food, so to speak. Uh, they understand the impact of animal uh, based food uh, 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 and impact on the planet. And therefore you see significantly a shift or a trend towards plant-based food uh, more so than ever, and therefore a significant impact on sustainability. On the health and wellness side, it's very similar. The crisis of exposed our consumers to uh, their need into taking a better care of themselves, their understanding of that food is your first medicine. And, and again, you can do something uh, and you can act on being healthier and better. And eating better has a direct impact on uh, feeling better and, and, and living a better life. And therefore, people understand more than ever the uh, importance of uh, and the impact of pesticides and, and how organic uh, uh, can play a, a significant role in their life in terms of uh, benefits. And therefore, consumers, again, expect uh, to eat uh, more fr fruits, vegetables, and, and better for you food that have a better impact on people's life and well-being and and planet. So, for all the companies in 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 the in the North Bay areas that have been organic before it became trendy or cool, definitely I want to say to them they are in a good place. Yeah, they 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 need to communicate more because consumers uh, are in need to get to know the brands that mm -hmm. are doing good for uh, them and the planet. Great. Thank you, Xavier. I've, I've often said for the last six months, we need healing on so many levels, mind, body, and, and you know, every, every way. So uh, earth, definitely. you're providing that. Thank you. So Carissa, uh, same question to you, except how this uh, applies to wine and agriculture. Sure. I, mean, I couldn't agree more with Xavier's comment on the role of sustainability. I think we're hearing that more and more people care about how their food is made, how their wine is made. And I think you know, we're so fortunate in Sonoma County, given our, our farmers' commitment to sustainability, that we're well positioned um, with our, you know, being a global leader in sustainable farming and, and grape growing here, um, that we were ready to sort of be there for consumers, even with a label on the bottle. So we have over 1.3 million cases of wine that come out of Sonoma County with our sustainably farmed grape label, which um, is, is, makes a nice impact on shelf and for the consumer. I think in addition to that, some trends that we see that um, are really good for, for uh, wine that I think will stay um, is just continuing and going back to sort of the root of the, the food and wine experience at home. So the idea of cooking, the idea of pairing, the idea of sitting down to family meals um, where you're sort of you know breaking bread and sharing wine. So I think that is a trend that bodes well. Mm -hmm. um, and also a huge um, change in sort of making wine more accessible and demystifying it. So mm -hmm. we've seen a complete boom in online wine sales. I know some mm -hmm. of our um, partner websites that are you know more broadly, not just our winery ones, but more broadly distribute wine have seen increases of you know 50% in their wine sales. And a lot of those are actually, um, the, that wine sale is being consumed by millennial consumers, which I think for the last couple of years when we've been on wine panels, we're hearing that millennial consumers are not wine consumers, that they might be enjoying cocktails, they might be beer consumers. And frankly, the COVID uh, pandemic has actually brought this young consumer group or younger consumer group into drinking wine. And they're finding that they're, it's something they're sharing with friends. Um, it's become more accessible as you've seen, again, the increase in sort of in market um, to, to purchase uh, wines online. So I think um, that is also really a good trend for us. Um, the, the other thing that's been great is so many um, folks have become backyard farmers, right? So folks, are, you know, looking for the do-it-yourselfers or in their backyard, they're growing tomatoes or they're growing lettuces or um, planting a, you know, a tree and um, so we're, we're bringing agriculture to a whole new generation of folks uh, around the country that, you know, are now our backyard farmers. And I think that's a great way for us to share about farming, share the lessons of farming, share how food is grown, um, and the role of agriculture uh, in general. And so I think that trend will be here to stay as well as people really appreciate growing things and also what it takes to grow something. It's not, mm -hmm. doesn't just happen. Uh, you actually have to nurture it and being a farmer is, um, is hard. 
is hard work and um, and takes a lot of diligence. And so I see those as trends that will, I think, really um, support sort of wine and agriculture, and Xavier food um, as we move forward, as people care more and more about that in Sonoma County and our diversity here uh, and our, our farming history and legacy, it really um, sets us up well to be a part of that conversation and be a part of people's homes moving forward. Great. great. Well, that's great news about millennial wine buyers because they buy everything online, right? Their couches, their whatever it is that they're, they're used to it. So training them to buy wine uh, uh, direct is, is great. That's great to hear. So to you, Ingrid, uh, uh, Keysight is a leader in many of the key technologies going forward, 5G, the wireless networks, uh, autonomous vehicles, et cetera. Tell us a little bit about um, where, where we're at and that on those trends and how they might impact us. Sure. Okay, so I have a, a slide here that I think has some interesting information about what uh, some of the key areas uh, that we are, are leaders in and some estimates about what the growth trajectory are and by what time frame. So as an example, if you look down at uh, aerospace defense, new satellite launches could grow by 300% uh, mm -hmm. in the next handful of years. So uh, these are just sort of our estimates and what we're seeing. Um, what this pandemic has done is accelerated some of these uh, significantly. Uh, for sure, digital transformations have now been a huge investment with many of our large customers and many large uh, organizations around the world are now making sizable investments to accelerate that. We're also seeing a lot of acceleration on 5G. So even though 5G is in its early days, there are some deployments underway um, they can't go fast enough now. Um, everybody's at home, everybody's seeing the need and the desire to have more bandwidth, faster um, bandwidth. And so this is going to uh, just continue to accelerate. And as a matter of fact, with all of the companies and, and individuals um, and organizations experimenting with different ways of innovating how to connect with each other, um, and keep the whole ecosystem connected, we are now seeing even more innovative use cases for 5G wireless connectivity. Hmm. And then lastly, um, this is also accelerating the future of, of just about every single one of these six areas, um, be it the internet of things as we all continue to um, connect um, in new and different ways. Um, 6G is now getting uh, accelerated um, it used to be more of a 2030 trajectory. Now we're seeing there's some indications of that coming um, probably before the end of uh, this decade. Right. right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. That's very, very, very exciting. Lots of things coming our way that will yeah. increase our connectivity. So uh, last question before we go to the Q&A, um, and, and this is to all of you, and I'm going to start with Carissa. How has the pandemic fires and speed of change, uh, how has that changed what um, is required of leaders today? Yeah, I think, you know, leadership has always required a lot of flexibility. Uh, I think, you know, that's one thing that stayed true through all of this. I think for, for me and our role with the wine growers, we really had to look at, you know, when do you, when are you in crisis management and when is it time to go back on the offense? And I think that's um, kind of a critical mm -hmm. piece Right now, as we've gone through COVID-19 and we've gone through the wildfires, so much of what we've been doing is really responding and really making sure yeah. you know, we're communicating and, and, and keeping that. But now we're ready to go back out and start telling the story of Sonoma County again. So I think we're feeling that need to go back out. Our, our um, farmers are ready for that. Our wine business is ready for that. And I think certainly consumers are ready for some of that positive messaging. So we've done that. And I think the other piece is really um, be able to make sure you're telling um, accurate factual story and information. And so we've been facing since 2017 over and over again in the media that, you know, wine country is burnt down mm -hmm. and the trickle down impact of that for tourism and our wine and our ag business um, can be detrimental. So really being, I think leadership today requires sort of having the right facts and being able to tell that story locally, nationally and broadly and sort of controlling the narrative mm -hmm with real information. And I think that's mm -hmm. gonna to continue to be true. Yeah, just, just think if we could change that story to how we've 
managed the wildfire threat to where we managed it down. Uh, yeah. So uh, hope, hopefully we will get there. So to Ingrid, to you again, how has the pandemic and all these other challenges changed um, what's required of leaders today? Right. Yeah, so I think very similar to what Carissa has said, uh, it's really all around uh, change management, um, having adaptable, flexible decision making, um, kind of leaning in uh, as, as, as the crisis unfolds. Uh, certainly at that point, you are being reactive, but also, at, you know, moving towards being proactive. Um, we have a team that we started up last June as we kind of stabilize through getting through the pandemic and its uh, initial impacts and it's called a Thrive Team. And that's an example where we are now proactive. We are shaping our future. We are trying to understand what are we gonna do with our real estate long-term? What can we do to continue to uh, look at different scenarios of should we continue to have people work from home? At what point and what would be the triggers to ask them to come back? What would be varying timeframes around that? So I think there's really a lot of uh, leadership lessons to be learned around making that change management, not just for your organization, but for yourself as to like, when are you through the crisis and now you can do some proactive leadership mm -hmm. and help the whole organization through you know abrupt change management to a more progressive change management over time to a future that you can impact and yeah. shape. You know, uh, Ingrid, we're uh, in some ways very lucky to have you here because you also manage a lot of the sort of HR functions of Keysight. And what are long-term recruiting retention trends are you sort of seeing? Yeah, this uh, slide gets just a, a little bit of it. And I think it was already mentioned um, in, in previous uh, comments that as, as people are now working from home and figuring out how, how effective that can be for them, many of them are questioning, why do I have to be in this part of the world? It is expensive. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them have recently graduated from college and perhaps are now spending money working from home um, where they could work from home perhaps with other roommates or in a different state or back home with their parents and save some money. So we are seeing some movement, um, certainly uh, again, movement from uh, some of the urban areas to suburban areas. So it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing for, for us particularly since most of our sites are in the suburbs. And in the past, it's been quite difficult for us to attract um, mm -hmm. some of the next generation out of those urban areas to either want to do the commutes or to come live in a more suburban area. So as much as we're seeing some trends towards people leaving California or leaving Northern California, there are equally offsetting potential trends of people yeah. coming back. Yeah. Interesting. The, the one other thing that we're keeping a, an eye on is, um, you know, we, we probably will over time continue to have our people come back to work. That's at least our vision to not have this work from mm -hmm. home Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly some people can make that work for them longer term, but part of our culture is being collaborative, making mm -hmm. fast decisions, being, you know, able to just kind of work together on a daily basis, more face to face. Um, but as we think about if some of our competitors, some of our talent competitors do offer that up and this becomes more of a perk, um, then we'll have to mm -hmm. think about how to remain competitive. Yeah. Interesting. All very very interesting uh, uh, data points and trends. So we'll bring Margaret back in if she's still out there somewhere and we'll go to audience questions, which I have here in, in front of me. And, and maybe uh, I'll start uh, with this one. And I think it's an, an important question. Uh, I was talking to uh, several uh, healthcare CEOs yesterday and the mental health stress on our communities is really showing up in their organization. So uh, I'll, I'll start maybe with Carissa. What are you doing to help with the emotional needs of your, of your workers? Sure. I, so we stay very connected. Our team does. Um, we have meetings three times a week um, and we do a lot of check-ins. We call it one of my, um, actually my right-hand uh, woman, Kate Piantech actually mentioned 
one day so they do a scale, right? So we check in, our, where are you today on a one to 10 in terms of how you're feeling about things and, and you know, whether that's a frustration, whatever that is. And so um, we do that kind of check in. We still are doing our virtual happy hours as a team um, mm -hmm. to sort of stay connected on that as well. And then I think, you know, when we work with our farmers, sort of the, the larger farm worker pool, um, as we've gotten much better at sharing resources in both English and Spanish, um, getting videos out there where it's peer to peer conversation. So farm worker to farm worker talking about safety and protocols, um, just so we're, you know, more, more connected in a, in a way that's meaningful and relevant, um, and not just sort of our, our old ways of how we used to do things. And so um, it's kind of that check-in, but that's, that's a benefit of a, a small team working at the wine growers is that I think we probably know as soon as we log into a call what someone's mood is that day, um, because, you know, we're, we're, it's, you know, or if they, maybe they're not putting on their video, we're checking and saying, hey, all yeah. okay, you know, what's going on? And so um, I think it's just important to keep asking questions and carve out that time that's not about just checking things off the to-do list or work. Yeah. It's about, you know, talking yeah. about who we are, how our families are doing. Yeah, good. How about you, Xavier? Uh, if I have one word, I would say caring, uh, Brad. Yeah. Yeah. It's time that leaders and managers do care about their people more than ever. And therefore, building on what Carrie Sai was saying, we, we really emphasize the importance of spending time to get to understand how people feel and what challenges they have to face every day. Not only you know working from home, but also when you have to come to manufacturing sites, when there you know there's a risk, and therefore, you potentially have fear. So it's a very important uh, as well that leaders communicate about how yeah. what is the right way to operate within the, this particular environment and how mm -hmm. we, we, so often we do test our people, not so much to find out if they are impacted by COVID, but more so to reassure them that uh, it's a safe workplace to be in. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, indeed, uh, we're proud to say that it's safer to be working for Amy's than to be outside in, in the community. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's how the world care, uh, this is what care means for us, is making sure we're building this safe environment for people to operate and also mentally safe for people uh, mm -hmm. that have been you know, out for more than eight to nine months now without yeah. a clear understanding about what's next. And, and yes. you know, we, we don't know, but at least we're over communicate on the company results, over communicate about the need of the company. And, and again, the vision, the purpose, the values are something that people are, are rallying behind and, and find a way to, 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 to do their work every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you for that. That's a great, great word to use, Kara. So Ingrid, how, how about you? Um, so I'll just uh, pile on to what Carissa and Xavier said. We're, we're all aligned on that. And then in addition, um, you know, saying that we care about our people and they're our top priority, their health and safety, but also investing in that. So we have uh, invested in providing uh, global uh, uh, platforms to have them go online and either um, do self-paced, you know, health, uh, be it mental health or physical health, um, self-paced uh, routines or, or podcasts or connections with even some uh, counselors, whatever, whatever that it's like a wide dynamic range of what's available to our employees in these platforms, making sure that we do carve out time to, um, yeah, not just check the boxes, but actually, you know, talk to people about just how are things going, uh, connecting them through um, some groups for, you know, just online um, best practices on schooling children at home or. Mm -hmm cooking or whatever, uh, just to make it to, to, to connect to the emotional side of all of this for people as well. Yeah, we were joking early on, you know, we were sharing tuna casserole uh, recipes, you know, just to, just to have something else to cook. Uh, so that, that's good. And what about the ergonomic piece, uh, Ingrid, with people working from home? I just know that that's a potential issue kind of hanging out yes. there. Definitely. And so, uh, you know, way back in March, we weren't sure how long this was going to mm -hmm. go on. But after a couple of weeks, we were definitely seeing that this was going to be a longer term trend. And we have implemented methods for employees to safely um, access and their equipment from the site. So be it their desks, their chairs, mm -hmm. 
their okay. headsets, their monitors, and deliver that to their homes for them. Yes, great, great. Um, Margaret, you're with us. Uh, any thoughts you might have on the discussion we had here around, you know, changes to our economy and our organizations, or any anything you'd you'd like to kind of close us out on? Sure, absolutely. And I just really want to applaud all the panelists' contributions today, and and particularly all of the commentary around, you know, the importance of staying connected, being empathetic, reaching out to whether it's your family members, your friends and your community, but you know, your clients, right? I think this is a great time to, you know, develop that level of trust, I think is so much more needed today than ever before, is having trust with your stakeholders, trust with your clients. And again, just staying connected and, you know, asking those in que the questions uh, that can really build that trust uh, over time. I really want to applaud Xavier's comment about leadership, that leadership is not about having the answers. It's about pulling people together. And I just absolutely love that. Um, and I think it's just so critical in this environment uh, for business continuity, for continuity with your, with your networks and your communities. And just uh, thank you everyone for all that contribution. That really, I think it really makes a difference uh, for all of us in this working environment. Well, well, thank you, Margaret. So I want to thank uh, Carissa, Xavier, and Ingrid, especially since you were very short notice. Ingrid, thank you for being with us. This was a fascinating discussion. Um, really, really uh, some very wonderful thoughts that you have sort of carrying us forward as we, uh, because this, this may not be it. Uh, you know, we may have something else come at us. Uh, so, and I like your, your thoughts around, hey, let's go on offense where we can not be you know, constantly reflexive, although we have to be sometimes. So thank you to all and good luck on all your organizations. They're all doing tremendous uh, work. And I wanna thank Union Bank uh, for being with us this year. This was different, I, we know, and uh, they, they stayed with us and, and we appreciate that. And everyone take care and um, uh, this will live on our website. And thank you very much for all our attendees for being with us here today. Thank you again. Thank you again, Margaret. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.